Okay. So I'll, let me introduce myself. I'm Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, and I'm the uh, director of the Forest Connect program. This webinar series is part of that uh, Forest Connect program. It's a monthly webinar on the third Wednesday of each month. Now, originally we had uh, scheduled for today a, a different talk. I had uh, ran into some scheduling conflicts with the presenter, and so that's going to be rescheduled. So. Uh, you all, all will be, uh, you're probably already on the email distribution list for announcements for webinars, and you will receive notice of that. Next month is going to be, that's November, let me think, uh, November and December. November, I believe, is on uh, using birch and walnut to make syrup, and December is on um, the economics of gourmet mushroom production. So, all right, well, let's get started. Today we're going to be talking about an introduction to the identification and ecology of northeastern hardwood tree species. This has been approved by the Society of American Foresters for one credit, I think, of Category 1, but I will send notification of that. You all uh, responded, you were required to respond in the registration page to the desire for continuing education credits. So you'll receive notice. Uh, I gave this presentation a few years ago. I was looking at it online, and it was about an hour and 45 minutes, which is way too painful. So I'm going to be moving at a faster rate than I did then, I hope, and we will uh, see where all this takes us. Okay. So first, I want to acknowledge that I have um, received a lot of assistance, particularly in the form of pictures from uh, a website called forestryimages.org, and I've drawn information from a lot of resources, particularly the Silvix Manual, which you can see as that web link. So if you've downloaded a copy and saved a copy of this presentation, you'll have those links, or just do a Google search for uh, Silvix Manual. There are some online tree resources that I recommend. And then uh, my former major professor up at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse is Don Leopold. And he wrote a book, Trees of New York Native and Naturalized. So Don has a couple of books out. Uh, they're all exceptionally well done. So anything you get from Don is going to be is going to be good. So these are resources kind of to point you towards. Um, the second thing I'll point your attention to, and this is this has a caveat with it, but there's an online course uh, that's that was an outgrowth of this presentation. And what I did was I, you know, what we're going to cover in one hour, you can see, is going to be broken out into lessons two, three, four, and five. So we take an hour, we cram it all in, we only cover 10 species, there we cover a lot more species, but you can see that there's more detail. It's an online course, it's unmoderated and asynchronous. The caveat is, I was checking it out today and I couldn't get several of the presentations to play, so I need to understand what's going on with that. But that is a location that you can go to, moodle.cce.cornell.edu, they have online courses you'll need. and uh, an instructor's key or password kind of key. So send me an email, and I'll be happy to provide that to you. Um, it's just this is for people that want more uh, more detailed information about trade identification. There are, it's an online course. There are no continuing education credits for that. So okay. So when we talk about um, identifying trees, we want to focus in on. I'm, this is jumping around on me. Okay, so what we want to cover today um, are the species that you see here. We're going to run from shade intolerant quaking aspen and paper birch down to shade tolerant sugar maple and American beech. And what I'm hoping you'll be able to do is list some of the learning identification skills. We'll cover those now. And then also uh, list features of hardwoods that are going to aid in their identification. So we're also going to cover a lot of information about ecological features of trees and their habitats. 
and I'll conclude each of these 10 species with the best recognizable features. So hopefully you'll be able to, by the end of the day, be able to zero in on the best recognizable features um, for at least five of those species. The process of learning how to identify trees uh, involves some kind of four components of learning. Uh, the first of these is to be able to match a descriptive characteristic with a visual characteristic. Uh, so there's two examples there. Those are, are uh, things that you, descriptions that you may read or hear, and you need to be able to associate those words with what you're seeing in a specimen that you're looking at. So that's one component of learning is kind of the matching uh, or, or the language. You also have to, f have to figure out which features are going to be most reliable as uh, tools to identify. And in my experience, leaves have the greatest amount of variability, uh, less so is bark, less so is twigs, and less so is fruit. So if you can get your hands on fruit, that's often a very effective way to go about learning how to, uh, learning to identify that particular tree. There's an enormous amount of, um, uh, there's an enormous amount of terminology. I give some examples there, serrate, crenate, attenuate, emarginate, orbicular. Uh, those all refer to the margin of the leaf. So the margin is a term that's the edge of the leaf. But there's a lot of terminology. And what I would suggest is that you try not to get too bogged down in that. I will try to avoid it where I can. Um, but, you know, terminology, we have terminology because there are occasions when it is actually quite useful. So it's a handy thing to have access to. And then finally, you'll want to learn how to use some dichotomous keys. And a dichotomous key simply means that you're given, it assumes that you're looking at a specimen, and the key is a table that effectively gives you two statements, and you match. You know, one or the other statement is true relative to the specimen that you have in your hands. And uh, you pick the statement that is true. That directs you to a next to the next pair of questions. That's why it's dichotomous because these these statements are always in pairs or called couplets. And then you're able to uh, proceed through this. Essentially, it's a flow chart more or less that allows you to uh, identify a particular tree. So um, when we're learning the trees, there are different things to look at. We've talked about those a little bit. We're going to be focusing on fruit and twigs and foliage and bark. Other things that you can sometimes use and that we'll mention on occasion are flowers and crown architecture and habitat and shade tolerance. So those all have, uh, those all have utility, and it's handy when you're thinking about the um, the ecology of a particular species to be able to understand its shade tolerance or its habitat, and it may or may not help with identification. So let's get started with the first one. Uh, the first species we're going to look at is quaking aspen. This is Populus tremuloides. And I'll be focusing on a particular species, but all of these species occur within a genus. And oftentimes the, the genus has characteristics that are um, recognizable. And so if you see a particular feature, you can say, I know this is in such and such a genus, or maybe in one case we're going to look at such and such a family. So we're going to be jumping back and forth a little bit between genus and species. So when we talk about genus and species, in this case, the first word that's italicized, populus, is the genus. Uh, the specific, technically, the specific, specific epithet is tremuloides, so it's quaking aspen or trembling aspen. The other species that are related to quaking aspen include big tooth aspen, eastern cottonwood, and uh, balsam poplar, which is also known as balm of Gilead. So all of these uh, occur within the genus Populus. Uh, all of these occur within the Northeast. Quaking aspen occurs uh, from the uh, from east to west in the geographically from east to west in North America. 
species like big tooth aspen occur just from the northeastern uh, through the lake states. Uh, Balm of Gilead tends to be more of a northern species. These are all relatively uh, soft wood, so it's a relatively light wood, low BTUs, low heat value. They're all intolerant of shade. They all tend to be uh, dominant. When they occur, they tend to be dominant early in successional series uh, and, and dependent upon disturbance in order to, uh, to reproduce. Uh, most of them if not all of them, I'm not so sure about cottonwood, but all the others, if you cut the parent stem or disturb the parent stem, suckers will form from the roots and uh, reproduce vegetatively. So, um, here's another look at quaking aspen. On the left, you can see that it has uh, the margin of the leaf. So the margin, this is the margin, the edge of the leaf. Uh, on quaking aspen usually is very finely toothed, which is not so evident here. This looks more like it is um, kind of an undulate margin. That's in contrast to big tooth aspen, which has large teeth. So that's the primary distinction between these two in terms of uh, botanical structures. Uh, I've circled the petiole on this particular plant, and it would apply to all of the genus Populus. The genus Populus has a flattened petiole. Well, I can say that for quaking and big tooth. I need to double check that for uh, balsam poplar and for deltoides, for cottonwood. Uh, but that flattened petiole, you can imagine, makes it strong in one plane, the, th the thick plane or the wide plane, and then in the perpendicular to that where it's flattened, it's very weak. So that gives the, the leaf the ability to quake or flutter easily in the wind. So both big tooth aspen and quaking aspen both have that. It's a flattened petiole. So if you find a flattened petiole, you know that you're in this genus populus. There's no other genus that I'm aware of that has that flattened petiole. So that's a genus characteristic. Here's a look at the flowers and a look at the bud. And I believe in many of these cases, you all are able to zoom in your screen. Uh, on my screen, it's uh, directly above the word tremuloides. There is a plus sign and a minus sign. So if you want to see some of these features in greater detail, you can zoom in and zoom out. One of the characteristics that I like to focus on when I'm first looking at a tree and trying to recognize what it is, is what's called leaf arrangement. And leaf arrangement is typically going to be what's called opposite or alternate. And because the leaves originate from buds, we can also talk about bud arrangement. So here we see the buds on the, uh, on the right hand side, there's a bud here, and then there's another bud here. So these buds alternate on the stem. If they were opposite, then at each location there would be a pair of buds. So here you can see my pointer, and there's a single bud there. If it was opposite, then there would be a bud on the opposite side of the twig from the bud that we see. So this is an alternate uh, leaf arrangement, an alternate bud arrangement. That's my. That's usually my first cut. If I'm if I don't know what something is, then my first cut is is to know whether it's opposite or alternate. If somebody sends me a picture, or somebody asks a question, I'm always going to ask first: Are the buds paired together on the twig, or are they uh, alternating or staggered on the twig? So that's that's a helpful thing to know. So all you know, this is uh, this is going to be characteristic for. It will be the same within a genus, it will always be the same. I think usually within a family, it will always be the same. The one exception to that is alternate leaf dogwood. Most of the dogwoods are opposite, and alternate leaf dogwood is uh, alternate. Here's what it looks like in forest stands. Most of these pictures, I think, uh, well, the two on the left are probably uh, Western pictures or Midwestern pictures. You can see that. Quaking aspen, as I said, when it's disturbed or harvested, will reproduce from root suckers. And so you have clones. This will produce clones of these uh, aspen trees. Uh, and, and it may be that, that 
you know, in any one picture that we're looking at, the majority of those stems may all have originated from the same parent plant. Uh, it's kind of interesting when you see these on a landscape because they will all, you know, the foliage all changes color at the same time if they're if they're genetically identical. Uh, the other thing to point out on the left, you see that the bark tends to be fairly white, and uh, in the middle picture, the bark tends to be kind of a creamy or an olive color. That's the range of colors for quaking aspen and big tooth aspen. So that uh, they can they can run from very white and almost look like paper birch to an olive color. And they can also have, as they get bigger, the bark gets uh, more heavily textured, and in some cases can look a little bit like uh, northern red oak. So we'll see northern red oak in just a few minutes. Um, the other thing I'll point out with uh, these features or with quaking aspen versus big tooth aspen, in my observation, I've seen uh, big tooth aspen tends to occur more on drier sites and quaking aspen, I rarely see big tooth aspen on moist sites. Uh, I typically see quaking aspen more on moister sites, but it can, it can occur on drier sites as well. So there's a little bit of habitat differentiation between those two species. So to summarize, uh, best recognizable features for quaking aspen, we have uh, small teeth uh, on the leaf margin. The petiole is flattened that tends to occur on moist soils and the buds, I forgot to mention this, the buds are, let me bounce back, the buds you see are glabrous, so that means they're without hair and um, and there's no no other structures on those. Big tooth aspen tends to have hairs on uh, some of the bud scales. Uh, the bud scales are described as imbricate, which means overlapping. So when Brian says that they have big tooth aspens and wetlands in Massachusetts, so uh, the, the ecological uh, habitat separation doesn't always hold true. They are. Uh, all these species are intolerant of shade. They will not replace themselves without a major disturbance. Uh, if you go into a woodlot and you cut a single big tooth aspen and create a small canop in the opening, you may have um, you, you may have uh, some suckers that reproduce, but those suckers will only live for a year or two because there's not enough sunlight. Uh, they, repro they reproduce vegetatively. They're used for essentially low-grade products, uh, paper, uh, chipboard, uh, some internal trim. Uh, wildlife, particularly grouse, uh, will feed on the flowers and buds. And because the trees have fairly soft wood, they're, they're easily excavated for cavities. Uh, forest tent caterpillars will affect quaking aspen, as will hypoxylin canker, which is a fungus. So, all right, moving on to paper birch, another shade intolerant species. What we'll find in the northeast and midwest species such as paper birch or white birch, uh, sweet birch, also called black birch, yellow birch, gray birch, and river birch. So these are all in the genus Betula. Uh, these are in the, in the birch family, which is Betulaceae which then also includes eastern hop hornbeam, which is Austria virginiana, American hornbeam, which is Carpinus carolinian, and hazelnut, which is in the genus Coralus. And there's, as I recall, there are two species of hazelnut. So this is the family Betula. One of the characteristics of the family is that it has what's called doubly serrate leaves. And by doubly serrate, it means that there are big teeth and then there are little teeth. So big teeth, little teeth, medium size, big tooth, little tooth. So there's alternating, typically alternating, big teeth with little teeth. And that's the case uh, for every species in the genus Betulaceae. So if you find a doubly, ser or, yeah, doubly serrate leaf, and serrate means toothed, like a, a serrated knife, is a toothed knife. Uh, so if you find the margin is doubly serrate, you know that you have something from the genus, or from the family Betulaceae. 
Here's what the bark looks like. The bark on younger trees is actually uh, kind of brown and smooth. You can see these little bumps or ridges are called lenticels. They're persistent as the bark matures and the bark begins to exfoliate. Uh, the bark can be very white. The bark can also get kind of dark and, and ragged looking as it gets older and more mature. So I'm seeing a, seeing a question about getting a copy of the PDF. So if you want a copy of this presentation, you go for the live, uh, I say the live presentation, it's for you who are watching this as a live presentation, you can't do this when it's archived. Go to the file menu, save as, and select document, and then make sure you save it as a file type um, PDF. Uh, here's what it looks like in um, growing in a more or less a pure stand. You can see, though, that the crowns of these trees have started to die back. And uh, that may be simply a function of old age. So this looks like a fairly poor site quality. It looks like a steep slope and a rocky slope. So it may be fairly poor soil nutrition and the trees won't live very long. So in my woods, I have a fair amount of of big tooth aspen as well as uh, paper birch. The forest is, most of these are old farmlands that were abandoned in the 50s and 60s, so 50 to 75 year old woods, and the paper birch and the big tooth aspen are starting to die. So that's, that's what you expect with an early successional dominant. So, uh, but you can see here, they, they can be very picturesque. There's an area, if, for those of you in New York, if you've driven into Lake Placid from the, from the southeast, from Keene Valley, you'll remember driving along, um, I can't remember the name of the ponds, but it's a narrow area and the size of these slopes 20 years ago were just 100% uh, paper birch and it was beautiful and spectacular. Those have now started to decline and other species are starting to take their place. So the best recognizable feature for paper birch is white exfoliating bark. Um, the, the, for the family, remember we have doubly serrate leaf margins. These are early successional species. Uh, all of the, most of the oil paper birch is yellow birch is uh, mid to late successional species. Uh, we didn't go into paper, into yellow birch and, and black birch. Uh, both of those, when you scratch the stem or the twig on yellow birch and black birch, have a, an aroma of winter green. Uh, paper birch does not have that. Gray birch is also an early successional species, uh, tends to not get very big and, and will occur on very uh, poor soils. So interestingly, paper birch Birch is usually thought to require mineral soil for, for best seed germination, but it can also occur on stumps and logs. So the seeds may land on a stump or a log. The roots will grow over the uh, kind of the outside of the stump or the log. Over time, the stump or log rots away and the tree is left uh, stilted. So unlike the aspens, uh, genus populus, there is no vegetative reproduction from the root system. These will sprout from the stump when they're cut. Okay, uh, slightly still intolerant, but uh, slightly less, um, more tolerant of shade is black cherry, which is Prunus serotina. So the genus Prunus is a fairly, uh, fairly large genus and it's part of a very large family. So it's part of the rose family, Rosaceae. Uh, if you're familiar with flowers, you'll know that all rose flowers have five petals. Uh, so the rose family from a tree perspective includes apple, which is in the genus Malus, plum, which is in the genus Prunus, and then rose. Um, also, amyl, I think amylanchor, the service berry, is, I believe, also in the rose family. So the the cherries that we might think of, the two common ones are black cherry. Some people will refer to it as wild black cherry. And there's also fire cherry and pin cherry. 
Uh, both of those are native. Uh, there's a clonal shrubby cherry that's called choke cherry, and then there's another cherry that I believe to be introduced, which is often called bird cherry or sweet mazard cherry. One of the features of the genus, and I've circled it in the upper picture, uh, and kind of in the center of the picture, at the very base of the blade of the leaf, and then I'll move my pointer away if you want to zoom in, at the very base of the of the leaf where the leaf blade connects to the petiole, so the petiole is the stalk, you'll see a sl kind of a slight bump there. And if you could zoom in on it or go out this afternoon before all the leaves go away and find a cherry leaf, any prunus, uh, which includes plum, you'll see a pair of glands. Uh, sometimes it's just a bump or kind of an enlarged um, tooth at the base of the leaf. But that's characteristic of the genus Prunus. Okay, so here's a couple pictures of this uh, growing in the forest. Uh, it will germinate in, in fairly low levels of sunlight, but in order to survive, black cherry needs to have almost full sunlight. It's one of, in New York, it's one of our most valuable species. Uh, it's probably not as valuable as black cherry, I'm sorry, as black walnut, but black cherry is, is more common and uh, occurs. It has a very wide or long geographic distribution from Canada down into Mexico. Here's what the bark looks like, just kind of three variations of bark of the same tree. And I've heard this referred to as having burnt potato chip looking bark. So you imagine uh, roasting potato chips in an oven, burning them, and then attaching them to the bark of a tree. If you zoom in on those, you would see that they also have lenticels. You remember that, that paper birch and most of the birches have lenticels. So uh, you can still see those even on a mature tree, but it looks like burnt potato chips, very distinctive bark. Here's a look at the twig. Uh, the twig tends to be relatively stout. Um, it's, it's of medium stoutness for black cherry. It's of finer diameter, a smaller diameter for pin cherry, and it's a larger diameter for sweet mazard cherry or bird cherry. Uh, the, the buds are alternate. You can see the bud arrangement is alternate. All of everything we've talked about so far has had alternate leaf and bud arrangement. Uh, the buds are imbricate. What's most noteworthy about the twig is if you scratch the twig, there's it's described as um, a burnt almond smell, which I'm not sure, I don't know what burnt almond smells like other than that's what a scratched uh, black cherry twig smells like. All of the cherries will have the same smell. Uh, what you're smelling is a hydrogen cyanide. So what happens when the tree uh, when the tree is damaged, uh, it releases hydrogen cyanide. So you can you can chew on a twig that's alive. Livestock can eat live cherry twigs and live cherry foliage. They usually don't. It's not usually a preferred browse species. The problem is if you trim, let's say you have a pasture and you trim the, the black cherry around the edge of the pasture and leave the branches in the pasture, for several hours to a day or so after you've pruned it, the tree is releasing hydrogen cyanide. So if livestock come over and eat that, uh, that foliage as it's wilting, uh, it may very well kill them. Um, after it's completely wilted, there's not a problem. So, but, but as you go into it, um, you know, those can be a problem. And the, you know, the classic story, and I don't know if this is actually true, but the classic story is, you know, a Boy Scout camp, some Boy Scouts go out and they, uh, it's getting dark, and they take their pocket knives out and they go to the edge of the field and they find some twigs and they cut off some twigs to roast hot dogs on, and it's either choke cherry or black cherry, uh, both of which would grow in a, in a in a setting such as that, they put a hot dog on it, and as the hot dog's roasting, it's absorbing the hydrogen cyanide, and then you end up taking a bunch of Boy Scouts to the hospital. So I don't know if that's true, uh, but I've always stayed away from uh, black cherry twigs when I'm roasting hot dogs. So if some of you try it and you learn otherwise, let me know. So I'm just kidding with that, of course. Don't actually try it. 
Okay, here's what uh, the fruit look like. The fruit are edible, so you can go out and you can collect, collect black cherry and you can eat them to your heart's content. What you'll find, though, is that you have um, a very high percentage of the diameter of that fruit is made up of the pit or the, the stone of that fruit. So you'll get a little bit of flesh on the outside and then a lot of pit on the inside. So yes, you can eat them. They're not going to hurt you at all, uh, but they're not going to be a very rewarding experience. And what you see on the right is uh, a harvesting system that would be used to regenerate black cherry. So remember, black cherry needs to have high levels of sunlight. Uh, the seeds are not wind blown. Uh, the two previous species, uh, genera, the birch, genus and the populus genus, both would have wind dispersed seeds. Uh, cherry is not wind dispersed, it's bird dispersed and it's gravity dispersed. So if, uh, if you want to regenerate it, you need to have trees that are close enough together that you get seed rain, but not so close together that you obstruct sunlight getting to the forest floor. So this would be a harvesting, a regeneration uh, system known as a seed tree system where you leave the seed trees behind you regenerate the forest, and then you can come in in a second entry and remove those seed trees. All right, best recognizable feature. Oop, I missed that. Let me jump back to that first picture. So here along the midrib, you'll see what looks to be like an orange pubescence. Um, pubescence just means fine hairs. So this is often, but not always, uh, a feature of black cherry leaves. It tends to be more common, on, I think, on black cherry leaves that are growing in really full sunlight rather than black cherry leaves that are a little bit shaded. So that orange pubescence, if you see it, then it's diagnostic for Prunus serotina, uh, specifically to black cherry, none of, not the other uh, cherries. If you don't see it, you don't know because not every black cherry will have that. So it may often have pubescence in the lower midrib, singly serrate leaf margin of fleshy fruit with a large pit, burnt potato chip bark, bitter almond uh, smell and taste when you scratch the twigs, and then a pair of glands on the petiole define the genus. We've talked about the uh, hydrogen cyanide that's produced from the foliage as it's wilting or damaged very high value wood. Uh, it's beautiful for those of you who do, wood, do woodworking. It's a beautiful wood to work with. It handles well, it dries well, and uh, has a very lovely patina. Tends to be an early successional species, grows in full sun. Um, wildlife will eat the fruit. And um, almost every, every species of wildlife will eat the fruit. And the mass crops will happen on a cycle of about one to five years. So a mass crop, and I'll refer to this in other species, a, a mass year is, is a year when a particular uh, species has, a, has an overly and above average production of fruit. So for some of those species like white ash, it happens every two to four years. Beech, it happens about every seven years. And these are averages, so don't, you can't, tell time by the, by the periodicity of the mass crops, but it, it gives you a sense. Um, and as with the other members of the rose family, this is susceptible to the eastern tent caterpillar. Uh, we'll look at the forest tent caterpillar in a minute. The eastern tent caterpillar is the caterpillar that has the tent. So Michelle is asking, how to tell the difference between black cherry and buckthorn? That's a great question. The bark looks a little bit the same. Uh, so a couple of differences would be, so in the leaf margins are both going to be about the same. I don't have handy a picture of buckthorn, but the two big differences with buckthorn, the leaf arrangement is described as sub-opposite. So the leaves are always paired, but they are offset ever so slightly. So there's always there's one leaf, there's always another leaf, but it's never directly opposite. The two leaves are never directly, typically not directly opposite one another. So that's one difference. Um, a second difference, and let's see if we can see this on the um, on the foliage. If you look at these veins, the veins uh, originate from the midrib and then more or less end at the edge of the leaf. 
So that's a that's a standard pinnate venation pattern. Buckthorn has a pattern that's called arcuate. And with arcuate venation, that so this is the, the main vein or the midrib, the, the secondary veins here uh, with arcuate venation, as they get close to the edge, let's say they're about 85% of the distance between the midrib to the margin, at, as they approach the, the margin, they will, let me switch over to a pencil here. No, that's not what I want. I'm trying to find something I can draw with. Here we go. They'll well, they'll come out and then they'll they'll all bend up like this. So they would all come up and they and then the arcuate they all move towards the tip. I've got a, a big clunky writing implement here. So here we go. I'll try this. So they all tend to go up like that versus going straight out, which is what we see with the with the black cherries. So um, the final thing is when you scratch the black cherry twig, you'll have that very strong odor. You'll get that winter or summer. You don't have that. I don't believe you have that odor with buckthorn. I think when you scratch the twig on a buckthorn, it's more of a yellow. There's kind of a color. I don't remember. Like kind of a yellowish or greenish color maybe. that. So try it. Find a buckthorn and try it. Um, and then buckthorns will often have a spine on the terminal end, the far end of the twig. So there you have that. All right, so that was black cherry. Uh, right. Moving on to white ash. So white ash is the first of our opposite leaf arrangements. Um, what you're seeing, though, is not opposite. So don't uh, don't get don't get uh, thinking that just yet. What we're also seeing is the first compound leaf. So this structure that you see is a leaf. Uh, white ash tends to have seven leaflets. Uh, green ash tends to have more. I think black ash has even more, and I don't remember what blue ash has. Blue ash was a Midwestern species I haven't seen since. I uh, used to live in Indiana. So they're opposite compound leaves. And the way, the way that you know that this is an entire leaf of leaflets rather than each of these being a leaflet, uh, because when you look at a leaf, leaves, leaves originate from buds. So at the base of every leaf, there's going to be a bud. So if you weren't sure, you could look at the base of those leaves or what you thought might be leaves. You would look for a bud. You wouldn't see a bud, but you would, uh, from that, you would realize that you're looking at a compound leaf, not a simple leaf. So all of the, the acronym for opposite leaves are maple ash dogwood. So if you find something that is opposite in the Northeast, and it's a tree, so there's some shrubs that uh, hydrangea is opposite. Um, catalpa might be confused as opposite. But typically, if you find an opposite plant, it's either a maple, an ash, or a dogwood. So it's very, very straightforward with that. Maple, ash, dogwood. White ash uh, and all the ash have buds. Uh, when I look at so the other ones that we've seen, the buds have imbricate bud scales. This does not have imbricate bud scales. I think of this as uh, technically maybe called the naked buds, um, but I just think I look at it. I think it's a bud that's covered with velvet. So that is um, that's uh, the way I think about it. The leaf scar is what's noteworthy and helps identify green ash from white ash. Uh, so Janet's asking about imbricate. Imbricate means that they're overlapping. So the shingles on a roof are are imbricate. The scales on a fish are imbricate. So the you have a scale, and those scales are overlapping. Here we don't see the scales. We just see what, what looks more like a a, a wrapped bud. Um, and, and I don't. There, I'm sure there's a technical name for that. And off the top of my head, I don't know what that is. If we look at the leaf scar. And so you can see the, the leaf scar here is this light colored structure uh, in the upper right hand corner. I'm outlining it in red. 
And what we see is that the bud sits in a V notch uh, nestled within the leaf scar. The way I remember that is that we have this V, -nat, v notch in the letter W. Now, if we were to look at this for green ash, we would see that it would be flat on the top and then rounded. So you'll have to just use your imagination. I drew what would be a flat top, and that's the way I remember that is because the letter G has this flat lip right there, right? So that's what that looks like. So it has leaf, the shape of leaf scar is shield shaped with green ash. It's flat on the top. With white ash, it's notched on the top. With black ash, it tends to be, as I recall, kind of oval, and then the bud sits above it like that. Um, here we see the fruit is called a Samara, and this is the seed portion. And you can see that the wing covers about one third of the seed. So that's going to be diagnostic. Notice down here you can see that the, the bud arrangement is opposite. So you can see a pair of buds there, kind of see a pair of buds there, another pair of buds at the top. Here's the, the bark of the mature white ash. It's described as ridged and furrowed. And uh, if you take a knife, so it's ashy gray on the outer side, and I'm not sure what it's called if you just kind of scrape away the surface of the outer bark, I call it scuffing it. Uh, on ash, it tends to be an ashy gray, so it's, you know, or a sand color. Uh, if you do that to black walnut, and that's where you would get confused, is the bark on walnut is going to look very similar to the bark on white ash. It's going to be dark brown when you scuff it on the inside. We don't have time to go into the evils of emerald ash borer. There are several webinars that we have done on emerald ash borer. There's uh, uh, eabuniversity.com. If you go to my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash forestconnect, you can look up EAB or emerald ash borer and you can see uh, webinars on the species. The key thing here is that the insect is invasive. It's very damaging. It does not spread particularly fast on its own. So uh, everywhere I go, whenever I'm talking to woodlot owners, uh, if they have ash, then there's always concern that they need to start cutting their ash because there is EAB. And my recommendation is until the EAB is within uh, probably 15 or 20 miles of your property, uh, you don't need to panic. You don't need to panic when it's that close. Panicking is not going to help. What you should be doing if you're within the area of EAB is shifting the dominance. If you have a high dominance of ash in your forest, you should be thinking about thinning your woods to uh, gently shift the, uh, the dominance away from ash, not trying to eliminate it, but shifting it to other hardwood species. So the best recognizable features, opposite compound leaves. Uh, the only other opposite compound is box elder, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Velvety bud scales, velvety bud, yeah, we'll call them velvety bud scales. Uh, V-notched leaf scar, um, and usually, I didn't mention this, but usually the outermost portion of the leaflet is serrate, the innermost portion of the leaflet. I'm always forgetting to mention the leaves. So, you know, this portion of the leaf usually is serrate. I do that because the, the leaves tend not to have, uh, the leaves tend to be uh, fairly um, variable. It starts off as quite tolerant of shade but becomes intolerant. Uh, moderate lifespan, 150 years, frequent mass crops, I usually think every two to three years, usually decent form, it can grow quite quickly and, and attain a high volume per acre. So, all right, now we're going to look at the oaks. We're going to look at two oaks, northern red oak and white oak. And uh, as we're doing this, we need to, so we have the, the family that includes oak is Fagaceae, F-A-G-A-C-E-A-E. -E. Uh, that includes beech and it includes American chestnut. 
The genus for oak is Quercus. Uh, there is a subgenus. There are two subgenera. There's the red oak subgenus and the white oak subgenus. The red oak subgenus includes northern red oak, which is what you're looking at here, pin oak, black oak, scarlet oak, and Schumard oak. I saw somebody was, I think, from the Midwest. Um, I grew up in Indiana, and I think when we took dendrology in forestry school, we had to learn, I don't know, 11 or 12 or 13 different oak species. So as you get further to the west, you get many more oak species. And as you go to the south, you pick up more oak species. The northeast is relatively poor in oak species. What characterizes the red oak subgenus is the presence of uh, what are called bristle tips. So if you you have sinuses, so these are sinuses and these are lobes. And on the lobes, you have bristle tips for the red oak subgenus. So all of the all of the red oak subgenus will have those bristle tips. Uh, they tend to have that subgenus tends to have fairly dark colored bark. The acorn meat is described as bitter. Uh, that's in contrast to white oak genus, subgenus, uh, which is described as sweet. Uh, the ones I have eaten, I would not describe any of them as sweet. The xylem is porous, and that's in contrast to the white oaks, which form plugs within the xylem. The, the buds on the red oak subgenus are sharp pointed, and with all of the oaks, so I tried to draw, this is a cross section of a twig, the pith in cross section tends to be stellate. Now, I, I only had the option to draw a very, you know, technically accurate five-pointed star here. So when, when you cross section an oak twig, it's not going to be quite that nice. Here's what northern red oak looks like. The oaks, all of the oaks, Quercus, tend to have buds clustered at the end uh, with red oak. Uh, the acorn cap is quite shallow. I usually think of it as a beret sitting on top of the nut, and the nuts tend to be relatively large and um, oblong in shape. Here's the bark on a younger tree. It's quite, uh, it's, it's a very uh, kind of solid looking bark, and as the tree gets bigger, the bark becomes ridged and furrowed. You remember that white ash was described as ridged and furrowed. Uh, this is also the differences is that it looks like you can, it's described as having ski tracks. So if you can imagine a fresh snow on a mountainside and you have these long, smooth tracks down that, down the side of that ski slope. So on white ash, it was ridged and furrowed, but you didn't have those smooth ridges as you have with northern red oak. If you take your pocket knife and you bore into the inner bark, so through the outer bark, into the inner bark on northern red oak, you have kind of a pink, peachy colored inner bark in contrast to black oak, which has a kind of a yellowy and a very bitter tasting inner bark. <clears throat> so that inner bark color is only good for differentiating, only useful to differentiate northern red oak from black oak. Best recognizable features are bristle tips, uh, shallow acorn caps, ski tracks in the mature bark, and peach-colored inner bark, uh, the stem self-prunes. Um, it's intolerant to intermediate, so it's not going to, it'll, it'll survive in low-light conditions. It does not do very well. In, in good sunlight, it grows, can grow extre extremely quickly. I have some red oaks on my property. I've been measuring the diameter growth as part of the uh, Northeast Timber Growing Contest. Uh, which is timbercontest.com, um, and I'm, I'm capturing about a third of an inch of diameter growth per year on trees that are 15 inches in diameter, so very fast diameter growth. The fruit matures in two years, so you can anticipate a seed crop. So you can actually kind of plan ahead if you're thinking about a harvest. Uh, you'll know when the fruits are maturing, uh, and you have one year to prepare for a harvest. Excuse me. Okay, white oak subgenus includes white oak, Quercus alba, chestnut oak, which is, I learned it as Quercus prinus, but I think now is called Quercus montana, swamp white oak, which is Quercus bicolor, and bur oak, which is Quercus macrocarpa. The key features here are that it has rounded 
lobes. It also has rounded sinuses as red oak, the red oak subgenus, but here it's rounded lobes. The bark tends to be kind of a light ashy color uh, and the fruits will mature in one year. To show you some of the other oaks, uh, this is the bark of of Quercus I learned it as Prinus. Now Montana chestnut oak is a very rugged looking bark. Quercus bicolor or swamp white oak is interesting because the acorns have this very long stalk. And here's a fun word for you, peduncle. Uh, the peduncle is the stalk that supports an acorn. Uh, swamp white oak also has bark that exfoliates. It's can't quite see it, but if you if you look at that branch in the center, you'll see that it looks like the bark is exfoliating. Here's a picture of the fruit. Also tends to be fairly elongated as northern red oak, but the cap tends to look warty. And then here's a picture of uh, gypsy moth. Uh, gypsy moth in in uh, much of the range of particularly kind of mid Atlantic. Uh, states was devastating on oak in the 1980s and 19, uh, early 1990s. White oak is uh, thought to have, uh, I'm not, well, I think it, and I think Don Leopold thinks it, some others may think so, it's, but the bark is highly variable. So here's three different kind of characterizations of the bark of white oak, highly variable bark. Note that it's ashy gray, it can be platy, as you see in the far right, or it can be, uh, or rather, <coughs> excuse me, it can be blocky, as you see on the right, or platy, as you see in the middle, or if you see it on the left, it can be kind of blocky on one area and then platy in another area. So its features are uh, rounded lobes, long uh, acorn with a coarse deep cap, Supposedly sweet acorn meat, the one that I ate made me think it wasn't sweet and that, and I haven't tried any since then, uh, tends to grow on drier sites. Intermediate and shade tolerance. The xylem, which is the vascular tissue that carries the water in the tree, uh, is, uh, will be plugged as, as those xylem tissues mature and become uh, into older wood, so the more interior wood, filled with plugs that are called tyloses. Uh, and that's what allows white oak to be used for wine barrels. If you used red oak, you would get leakage from those wine barrels. Uh, mass crops every four to six years um, tends to be fairly common, mixed in with pine on drier soils in, uh, in, in drier regions. All right, now we're going to look at two maples. Uh, two maples in the beach, and I think we're done. So the genus Acer is the, the genus of the maples. And it includes uh, red maple, silver maple, and box elder. These would typically be thought of as the uh, soft maples. And they have fruits that mature, at least red and silver, the fruits mature in the spring. The hard maples are sugar maple and black maple. Those have fruits that mature in the fall. And then uh, there is mountain maple and striped maple, which are probably most similar to the soft maples. But I don't recall off the top of my head uh, when their fruit matures. There's, there is often a, uh, a use of the word uh, acerifolium with a genus such as Viburnum acerifolium or Platinus acerifolium. Those are not maples, those are maple leaves. So acerifolium, the, the specific epithet is a kind of a compound word meaning maple-like foliage. Um, all of the maples, remember maple ash dogwood, mad, so these are all opposite. Uh, with the exception of box elder, uh, all of the other maples have simple leaves. Box elder has compound leaves. So if you find compound and opposite, it's either an ash or it's a box elder. Uh, Joanne's asking about how much uh, inundation can swamp white oaks tolerate. They have a very old one and it's, and it's amazing. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. It's um, 
I don't see swamp white oak very much. I, I see it every once in a while. I rarely see it uh, kind of standing in water. So I'm not I'm not sure. I would look the place I would go to look to answer that question would be the Silvix manual. So if you just do a, a Google search for uh, Silvix manual. Here we have uh, a picture of red maple foliage, and that's what we're focusing on is red maple, and we're comparing that to striped maple. So the first thing to look at with uh, red maple is that the margins of the leaf are described as serrate, and the sinuses, so I'm drawing an arrow there around the sinus, the sinus is an acute angle, so it's a sharp angle. That's going to be relevant when we look at the foliage of sugar maple. Stripe maple is also called goosefoot maple, and it has this kind of shape uh, to the outline of the leaf. <laughs> um, red maple will become quite large. They may be two feet in diameter. Stripe maple is almost never more than four or five or seven inches in diameter. So simple leaves. Um, opposite leaf arrangement. Here's the bud. The bud of the soft maples tend to be rounded. So this is a rounded bud. You notice that it has imbricate bud scales, so it has a scale, and those scales overlap. So that's a, a red bud, a blunt bud. It's not a sharp pointed bud. So red maple. Here's the bark. Uh, the bark can become quite platy. Uh, the thing to note with red maple is that those plates peel from the top and the bottom. Um, also with red maple, when you rub your hand on the bark, especially of a tree this size, you'll get flakes will be will come off. It almost looks like a pepper grinder. That's in contrast to what you see with sugar maple that does not have any flakes. So reddish twigs, reddish buds, uh, reddish flowers, a coarse but flaky bark, and the fruits mature in the spring. It's intermediate and shade tolerance. It has a uh, bimodal ecological distribution, so it tends to be uh, fairly uh, uh, competitive on dry sites and fairly competitive on wet sites. Uh, sugar maple is not competitive on dry and wet sites, but is, is more um, competitive on kind of the in-between sites, the music sites. It is uh, red maple is very infrequently affected by the forest tent caterpillar. It's an attractive wood, but it's seldom used because the trees tend to uh, form to, to decay on the inside, so it's hard to get uh, a good yield of lumber from the logs. You can make maple syrup from red maple, but the buds break sooner in the spring when the buds start to swell. The flavor of the sap is changed and usually becomes uh, distasteful. Sugar maple, uh, we're going to run over by a couple of minutes, but I'll go fast. Sugar maple, the key thing here, note that the sinus is rounded. So you see those sinuses tend to be rounded, and notice that the margin of the leaf lacks teeth, right? So it's a it's a it's called an entire margin rather than a serrate margin. Here are the buds. The buds are brown and sharp pointed. Uh, notice that they also have imbricate bud scales. They'll sometimes have what looks like kind of gray fuzz on part of the part of the bud scale. Uh, with many of these species, you can look for the terminal bud scale scar. So when the bud terminal bud breaks in the spring, here it leaves a scar behind. So this is. Uh, so if this twig was, was a picture taken, let's say, this year, 2015 growth, this is where that terminal bud was in April of 2015 before the leaf, uh, before the bud expanded and the leaf grew. Uh, so Mark wants me to comment on box elder as the poison ivy tree. Uh, box elder has three leaves a compound three leaf. So in that regard, it looks like poison ivy, which also has three leaves. But there's, uh, they're completely disconnected botanically. There's no toxin that I'm, I've ever been aware of associated with box elder. So you can climb in it, you can chew on it, you can chop it, and uh, you, you at least won't have the same reaction that you get from poison ivy. 
Here are the buds in uh, comparison. So we have sugar maple at the top, remember brown and sharp pointed, red and blunt for red maple, and then Norway maple, I didn't mention that earlier, this is an introduced species that can become um, uh, can become uh, dominant in some areas and, uh, and and overtake the woods. So that has very large red buds. So Joanne's telling me the Samaras of maple can be poisonous, uh, box elder can be poisonous to horses. So that's worth noting. Thank you, Joanne. Here are the fruit. <coughs> I'm pairing these up so red maple, uh, you can see on the right, the, they tend to be, uh, well, my red line isn't showing up, kind of V-shaped. Uh, with sugar maple, they tend to be more parallel. Although, if you, it takes a little imagination to convince yourself of that, though, doesn't it? Here's the bark on sugar maple. Uh, very smooth bark on the younger trees. Uh, becoming heavier as the trees get older, and the plates will eventually peel from the sides. So the best recognizable features for sugar maple, sharp pointed buds that are brown, smooth leaf margin, rounded sinuses, uh, the Samara wings uh, tend to be parallel, uh, tight hard bark. It's very tolerant of shade and it's preferentially browsed. Uh, there are some fungi and insects that will attack it. Uh, sugar maple borer is one of those. Asian longhorn beetle is uh, potentially a threat for, for all of the maples. All right, our final species, American beech, uh, considered probably more tolerant than sugar maple, uh, but uh, not greatly so. Both of them are very tolerant of shade, which means they can survive in the shade and uh, persist, and they just kind of have a wait and see uh, strategy, and they'll wait for a canopy gap, and then they'll be able to recover uh, their growth potential often from that if they haven't, if, if the tops have not flattened off. So you can see the foliage is simple and uh, alternate. And it looks a little bit like American chestnut. Sometimes it looks enough like American chestnut. I have to do a double take. Uh, the buds are, I think of them as, they look like missiles. That's just the way I've remembered them. They're kind of like brown, very long, sharp pointed missiles. Uh, and you can see them in the picture on the bottom right as well. The fruit is a has a spiny husk, although it's not at all painful. And then you can see in the bottom right picture, the nuts are three-sided. So, and I've had people tell me that they've eaten those. You can eat them raw. You can roast them. I think at one point I tried eating them raw, and they weren't bad. They were certainly far superior to any of the acorns I've ever eaten. American beech is a beautiful tree. So here's the. Um, Here's the bark on a healthy tree, smooth gray bark. When I grew up in Indiana, this is what all the beech looked like. Beautiful, magnificent trees in the forest. And uh, they run into a problem because there's an insect and a fungus that attacks the trees and causes the bark to look like this, which is a response to the fungus. And then that, uh, that kills the tree. Uh, American beech can form very stable subcanopy communities. So if you go into a forest and you s and what this picture is to, is illustrating is an understory that's dominated by American beech, uh, because beech bark disease, the combination of the insect and the fungus, occurs throughout most of the Northeast, uh, and the overwhelming majority, something like 99% of all uh, unique genotypes. Or can be infected, then uh, then there's a high potential for diseased trees to dominate the understory. It's not browsed, uh, whereas other species are. So we can get we're we're potentially seeing a shift in composition of the forest from diverse plant communities to potentially monocultures of disease-prone uh, American beech. 
So the best recognizable features include the elongated, sharp, pointed buds. The leaves have a very waxy feel to them when you grab them. They're singly serrate, smooth gray bark, and uh, until they get beech bark disease. Very tolerant of shade. Uh, deer will not browse them unless the deer are starving. So if deer are eating your beech, your deer have nothing else to eat. Infrequent mast crops. Uh, it's a, apparently a very nice wood. I've done a tiny little bit of woodworking with it. It has a nice look and a nice feel. It's quite hard. You'll butcher block end grain cutting boards and, and the blocks were supposedly made oftentimes from American beech. It can reproduce sexually by seed or asexually from the root system. It can also sprout from the stumps. Uh, and these sprouts, uh, vegetative sprouts, can be very prolific and exclude desired hardwoods. So to wrap this up, uh, I hope you take the chance to, to participate in tree identification. It's very fun. It's a gratifying experience. There are lots of field guides that you can get your hands on. Early on, I showed you the, the, the link to an online uh, in, a, in a printable version. It's the Cornell Know Your Trees field guide. That's a good starting point. It's, if you take it offline, it's free. I think we sell copies of them for about, I'll say, $10. It's give or take a couple of dollars, around $10. Uh, there are lots of other field guides that are available. Probably the best way to uh, to learn how to identify trees is make a collection of twigs and fruit, uh, label them, uh, make up flashcards with these best recognizable features. And, and I've used words, that descriptive words, and what's important is that you find the descriptive word that when you say it in your mind, that's what you are able to visualize. Uh, that's especially the case for smells. It's difficult for me to tell you what something smells like because what I'm associating as a smell may not be what you associate with a smell. Um, try not to get in the habit of just memorizing things, but have a structured way to learn them, to capture the knowledge, um, and then build on that knowledge through time. So, okay, with that, we are done. And if there are some questions, I'm happy to respond to them. So, Melanie says, Uh, wants to know about the universality of mast production. So, for example, red oak. From from what I've so it's kind of variable. There are some years where it's a mast year throughout for red oak. Let's say throughout all of the Northeast. And it just when I talk to other foresters in other states, everybody says it's a mast year for red oak. It's a mast year for red oak. There are, are other years when there will be one ridge is a is having a mast year for the red oak. The adjacent ridge, a half a mile away, you couldn't find an acorn to save your life. So, how's that for variation? I'd say that it's it ver it's uh, dependent on local conditions, and occasionally the local conditions will uh, synchronize. It, it may also be that you have some local conditions that that was initially uh, synchronous. But if you have some local weather patterns that develop, it may be that you lose fruit. So we see that oftentimes in one of the Cornell sugar bushes where we're, you know, we're hopeful for seed to regenerate the sugar maple. We'll get a good flower year, but because the sugar bush is, is kind of in a cold valley, uh, all it takes is one frost event in early May. All those flowers are damaged and then we don't get a good seed year. So it may be that in some cases, you know, all of the red oaks are producing flowers. Uh, and there's widespread but sporadic failure. So, uh, so Sharon says, might you not term the Norway maple an invasive? So that's not my terminology. Uh, I think if you look at New York State, they have. Uh, described Norway maple as an invasive species. So invasive is a is a legal term, legally defined term in New York. It means that it's a species that is non-native and that, and I'll paraphrase to basically mean does more harm than good. Um, and, and, and there are, uh, you know, so the, the Invasive Species Council 
I'm pretty sure designated Norway maple as an invasive species, uh, which frustrates some people. They, they designated black locust as an invasive species, which is my favorite tree, so that caused me a fair amount of angst. Okay, Maria likes the flashcard suggestion. Good. So Phil wants to know if you can accelerate uh, the acorns maturing. Um, there's no way to accelerate that. And what you need to do is allow those acorns to remain on the tree. So they have to be on the tree to mature. Uh, and, and you know that they're two-year-old because if you look at the ends of the branches, uh, you'll see, you know, so, uh, and I saw some this fall, earlier this fall, there were, I saw the 2015 growth and on the 2014 growth, there were acorns. So those those were those were acorns that were maturing. So the, the acorns that were formed on the 2014 section of the tree would be dropping now. So you want to let those drop. Uh, then you can start them as seedlings. Uh, I saw one landowner that planted them. He just took logs, um, made a kind of a raised bed in the forest, not very big. I'll say three feet wide by eight or ten feet long, filled it with leaves, and he puts the acorns in there, and then he puts a hardware cloth mesh over the top of that. And what that does is it allows the acorns to sprout, but it prevents uh, rodents from getting in and digging up the acorns and eating those acorns. Uh, then after the first growing season, the leaves fall, and you lift the lift the hardware cloth up, and then you're able to uh, dig up those seedlings and outplant them or put them into pots, something like that. So, Okay, well, that looks like, oh, here we have soil around Norway maple is so dry that we cannot grow grass. Or is this a common problem with Norway maple? I don't know. I have never heard that. Um, that doesn't mean it isn't so. I just I'm not I've not heard that. Um, one of the one of the issues with Norway maple is it has uh, very dense foliage, so it's going to be it's going to be quite uh, shady underneath Norway maples, and uh, I don't know if the if the density of leaves if it tends to shed the water to the outside edge of those trees and so that you don't get moisture, essentially ground surface moisture uh, inside the kind of the drip line of the canopy. I'm not sure. I, I would, so I don't, I guess you could do an experiment and, you know, plant the seed and, and try watering it and if it, if it does grow then you know it's a water issue. If it doesn't grow it may be a sunlight issue. I would be inclined to think it's probably a sunlight issue but I don't, I've never looked into that. So. Okay, well, I want to thank you all very much. You had some good questions and some good additions to the presentation. I learned some things. I appreciate that. So I hope you have a great day. Uh, webinar in November is going to be on making syrup from walnut and birch. So syrup's not just for maple anymore. Have a great afternoon.